Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Poisoning Prevention Packaging Act, or PPPA. Here's an outline of what I plan to discuss. I'll start with a very brief history of the poisoning problems that our country faced at the turn of the 20th century and some steps taken in the attempt to solve those problems. This all leads up to the invention of the very first safety cap. I will share the legal definition of child resistant and I'll explain how it's measured. I'll talk about some of the rules of the PPPA, including uh, what substances are regulated by this act, what's exempt and what's missing. And then lastly, I'll briefly talk about the term child resistant versus child proof. And this has implications for public education and outreach. Here are the basics. The PPPA is a law which requires certain household substances to be sold in child-resistant packaging. It was signed into law by President Nixon in 1970, and therefore it is celebrating its 50th year anniversary. The purpose is to protect children under five from poisonings and deaths that can occur when children open containers of hazardous products and access the contents. This is the definition of child resistant taken straight from the legislation. A child resistant package is one that is designed or constructed to be significantly difficult for children under five to open or obtain a harmful amount of the contents within a reasonable time. In addition, the package must not be difficult for normal adults to use properly. Why is that part of the law? Well, because studies show that if an adult cannot easily open the child-resistant container, then they simply won't use it. They might just leave the cap off or store the contents in something else. This puts children at risk. Also, if the adult cannot properly reclose the locking mechanism, then the, the cap is worthless. By its very definition, child-resistant is not child-proof. That is just not something that can be guaranteed. Let's take a quick look at the poisoning problems that our country faced at the turn of the 20th century and the various steps taken in an attempt to solve those problems. These steps all eventually lead to the inception of the PPPA. The early 20th century is referred to as the Consumer Chemical Revolution. Due to advances in understanding germ theory, Americans became obsessed with household cleanliness and personal hygiene. Also, there was a proliferation of pest control chemicals and other household chemicals, particularly right after World War I and again later after World War II. Both of the, both of the above included a lot of caustics, and there was little to no regulation. The turn of the century also brought the invention of tablets and gel capsules and increased means for mass producing them. So we have a lot more medicines and chemicals in the home and booming industries to produce, market, and sell them. There's no shortage of examples of poisoning concerns during this time, but I picked three that I think really demonstrate what can go wrong when people do not have adequate safety information or mechanisms in place to help prevent accidents. I hope at least one of these is new to you. Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup. This was a product widely marketed in North America and England in the late 19th and early 20th century as a cure-all medicine for fussy babies. The primary ingredients were morphine and alcohol, and that was not listed anywhere on the package. Parents had no idea what the ingredients were. It is estimated that thousands of children died from overdose or from morphine addiction and then withdrawal. As I mentioned, the 1920s saw widespread use of caustic products in the home. During this time, physicians began to express alarm at the increasing number of gruesome pediatric injuries from accidental ingestion of caustics, particularly lye soap. And lastly, in 1942, there was a terrible accident at an Oregon State Mental Hospital. A cook sent a patient who was helping out in the kitchen, which apparently that was a very common practice at that time. The patients worked in the facility. Uh, anyway, he sent this patient to the storeroom to get powdered milk. 
but the assistant came back with a very different white powder. He came back with sodium fluoride, which the institution was using to kill roaches. The cook mixed the sodium fluoride into a huge vat of scrambled eggs and served it to an entire cafeteria of people. 263 patients and staff were sickened and 47 people died. Here are some regulation milestones in our country which were all put into place to help prevent the kind of accidents that I just described. In 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, which made it unlawful for anyone to make or sell food or drugs which were adulterated or misbranded. In other words, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup would have to list morphine and alcohol as ingredients. In 1927, the Federal Caustic Poison Act was passed largely as a response to the huge problem of children ingesting lye soap. It required labels on all uh, poisonous or corrosive substances to warn people of the contents. In 1938, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed, which established quality standards for those three things. In 1947, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, was passed, which required proper labeling and packaging of all pesticides. All of this is leading up to the most encompassing of them all, the 1960s Hazardous Substance Labeling Act. This very important act spelled out what substances were considered hazardous. It required those substances to have statements of caution on the label using words like toxic, corrosive, flammable, etc. And it required labels to outline what protective measures consumers needed to take to prevent exposure. So now here we are in 1960. We have systems in place for requiring companies to tell us exactly what their products contain, for alerting the consumer to any hazards, and also providing instructions for safe use. But we still have a problem. Childhood poisoning accidents are trending way up. Doctors in the later half of the 20th century now considered poisoning to be the leading cause of injury for children under age five. And approximately 500 children a, a year are dying from poisoning. For perspective, in 2018, US poison centers collectively reported a total of 14 deaths in the same age group. So far, we've been looking at regulations about package contents and labels as a means to prevent poisoning. Let's step into the Wayback Machine and talk about the design of the actual package. As early as the mid 18th century, bottles used to contain poisonous substances were designed differently to help present, prevent accidents. They often used bright colors such as green or amber or cobalt blue. They sometimes made the bottles in unusual shapes. My favorite are the ones in the middle there. Those are in the shape of coffins. And the bottles often had embossed designs on them so that when you grabbed the bottle, it would feel different. I love these triangular ones over on the left there with the word poison on them. And note the stopper lids on the blue bottles on the right with the really sharp edges. See the skull and crossbones along with the embossed ridges? By the way, these are highly collectible, so if you have anything like this at home, you might want to visit the internet and find out how much they're worth. The very first patent for a design to keep children out of a bottle is this. It was patented in 1871. It's an elastic band with spikes on it. So I guess the idea was in instead of swallowing poison, the children would just stab their finger? I don't know. All right, let's go back to the 20th century for a second. Doctors are sounding the alarm at the rising numbers of children injured by poisons, and many public education campaigns are begun. One of the biggest of them all, in 1961, President Kennedy signed a resolution designating the third full week in March as National Poisoning Prevention Week in an effort to, quote, call attention to the problem of dangers of accidental poisoning. 
However, despite attempts to reach the public, childhood poisoning numbers are still trending up, not down. Canada was also experiencing staggering increases in childhood poisoning exposures, primarily to medicines. This is Canadian physician Henry Bro. He probably pronounces it Henri, I'm going to guess there, the French spelling. Anyway, Dr. Bro in 1957 was the chief of pediatrics at an Ontario hospital, and he was also the director of the newly developed poison center at the very same hospital. As in the U.S., Dr. Bro and others tried public education campaigns aimed at parents, instructing them to keep all products out of the sight and reach of children. Also, just like in the U.S., it was not having much impact. In a documentary made about Dr. Bro, his wife recalls this moment. At 3 o'clock in the morning, he comes home and he says, you know, I've had it. I'm tired of pumping children's stomachs when they're taking pills that they shouldn't be having. I've got to do something about it. In 1964, he did something about it. Dr. Bro founded the Ontario Association to Control Poisonings, or the OACP, which was an advocacy group consisting of physicians, pharmacists, industry leaders, and poisoning prevention specialists. They announced a contest. Who could design the best child-resistant medicine bottle? They raised $1,500 as prize money, and they got over 200 submissions. So who won? This guy, Peter Hedgwick. He was a toolmaker who founded his own manufacturing company, also in Ontario. And for the contest, Hedgwick invented a device that he called the palm and turn cap. It required two dissimilar motions to open it. You had to push down and turn at the same time. And this proved to be really complicated for young children to navigate. In 1967, Hedgwick patented his design, and that image on the right there is taken directly from the patent. And those are his drawings. Dr. Bro lobbied to get Peter Hedgwick's palm and turn cap tested in the community served by the hospital, and he succeeded. And what do you know, childhood poisoning dropped almost immediately by up to 91%. Use of the cap began to spread throughout Ontario and Canada. All right, meanwhile, back in the US, one year earlier, 1966, the chairman of the US FDA formed a committee to look into child resistant packaging. The committee eventually got word of Hedgwick's palm and turn cap over in Canada. Testing of this cap was implemented on an Air Force base in Tacoma, Washington, and the results were pretty astounding. Between May of 1967 and December of 1970, there were only 27 incidents of childhood ingestions of medicine. Based on historical data, the projections for that same time period should have been over 210 ingestions there were only 27. These were impressive results. Congress moved fast and proposed the PPPA, and Nixon signed it into law on December 30th, 1970. So how effective has it been? Pretty effective. This chart shows pediatric fatalities among children under age five between the years of 1972, just two years after the implementation of the PPPA, and 2018. The rate of pediatric uh, fatalities from poisoning dropped 92% during this time. The World Health Organization and UNICEF both state that child resistant packaging is one of the best documented successes in preventing accidental poisoning of children. Today, there are many different types of CR packages for all sorts of hazardous products. You're familiar with them. Some of them require you to squeeze while turning. Some require you to line up arrows on the bottle and the cap. Some have false lids or other tricky designs that children can't figure out, but they all have one thing in common. They have all passed a very strict test to earn the label child resistant. The rules are devised by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, which, by the way, is also responsible for overseeing all PPPA regulations. 
according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the basic definition of success is this. When it comes to packages, uh, including medicine bottles, 80% of children tested must not be able to open it within 10 minutes. If you're talking about a unit dose package, such as a blister pack, 80% of children should not be able to access eight or more units or a toxic dose, whichever is the smaller, within the same 10 minute time frame. And 90% of adults have to be able to open and reclose the package within five minutes. If these conditions cannot be met, then the package fails. Okay, let's do a deep dive into the law requirements. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is very specific about how the test is done. So if you're running trials to test a container, you have to arrange for up to four different panels of 50 children each. Here is the breakdown of ages required. Each child can be used to test only one or two packages. And if they're given two packages to test, the two packages have to be very different from each other. The tester has to set up a very familiar, well-lighted setting with no distractions. You can't test more than two children together at the same time. And of course, the containers have to be empty. Here's the procedure. The tester gives the child the package and asks them to open it. They wait five minutes. If after five minutes the package is still not open, then the tester provides a single visual demonstration. Also, if the child has not already attempted to use their teeth to open the package, the tester is allowed to say, you can use your teeth if you want to. Then they wait five more minutes. If 85% of the children are unable to open it within the first five minutes, and 80% total are unable to open it at all after 10 minutes, the container passes, and it can be legally considered child resistant. Here is what the Consumer Product Safety Commission says about the age breakdowns for the adult group that need to be tested. By the way, I do not know why 70% of all the subjects must be female. I tried to find that out. I couldn't find anything. If any of you have any ideas about why this might have been set up, could you please let me know? What is covered? These are the 30 categories of substances. All of them are deemed hazardous by that 1960s Hazardous Substance Labeling Act. I'll give you just a minute to take this all in. Note that in addition to what you see here, each one of these categories has additional stipulations. I didn't print them out because that would be monstrous, but I wanna give you an example. Uh, so under the category mouthwash, here is what is written. Uh, warning, lawyers wrote this, so it's a bit of a mouthful. Okay, mouthwash, except as provided in, in the following sentence, mouthwash preparations for human use and containing three grams or more of, eth of ethanol in a single package shall be packaged in accordance with the provisions of the PPPA. Mouthwash products with non-removable non pump dispensers that contain at least 7% on a weight-to-weight -weight basis of mint or cinnamon flavoring oils that dispense no more than 0 0.03 grams of absolute ethanol per pump actuation and that contain less than 15 grams of ethanol in a single unit are exempt from this requirement. The term mouthwash includes liquid products that are variously called mouthwashes, mouth rinses, oral antiseptics, gargles, fluoride rinses, anti-plaque rinses, and breath fresheners. It does not include throat sprays or aerosol breath fresheners." End quote. Whew. All right, so what is missing in the PPPA? Well, there are no pesticides. And that's because pesticides are already regulated by the EPA and also by FIFRA. There are no beverage, alcohol, or tobacco products listed, and that's because 
the packaging requirements for those products are regulated by the U.S. Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. There are no liquid nicotine products listed, and that's because these are a very uh, relatively contemporary invention. Um, however, the 2016 nicot uh, Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act was passed in response to the alarming numbers of young children who were suffering exposures to liquid nicotine as vaping became increasingly popular. So this act in, of 2016 does require liquid nicotine to be packaged in accordance with the regulations of the PPPA. And marijuana is not listed, and that's because marijuana is not legal in the federal government. <clears throat> However, many states who have legalized marijuana do have laws about child-resistant packaging. Not all of them do, but many of them do. And in that upper right-hand corner, the child guard slider is really popular. <clears throat> the slider is its like a baggie on steroids. It's a really heavy duty plastic, which is opaque, so you can't see what's inside of it. And the slider mechanism is pretty tricky to operate. It takes two hands. Um, it's not like a regular Ziploc bag. Okay, let's talk about exemptions and exceptions to the PPPA. Manufacturers of products can, uh, if they choose to, undergo a very lengthy and formal petition process to get their product exempt from having to use CR packaging. Here are some examples. Substances intended for use in institutional settings do not have to be packaged up in a CR container. So for example, a huge like liter container of hand sanitizer that is headed to a, a prison or a hospital does not have to be in a child resistant container. Substances whose physical characteristics inhibit or limit intentional ingestion. So examples given are topical creams or aerosol sprays. The argument is that a child will not be able to ingest an amount likely to be harmful within a short time. Um, most notably, oil of wintergreen is a substance which is regulated by the PPPA unless it comes in the form of a cream and then it is not. And I'm sure that as sea spies, you guys might take issue with that exception. Likewise, some powdered forms of drugs are exempt and it's the same argument. The, they believe that children lack the motor skills necessary to eat a large, large enough amount of the powder in a short time um, and children are also unlikely to be able to follow the steps required to dissolve the powdered contents in liquid and then drink all of the liquid. So powders are exempt. Note, only unflavored powders can be exempt because if the, flour, if the powder has a flavor to it, this might encourage children to eat a whole bunch of it. Certain medications are exempt from CR packaging. There's a really long list. I'll just share with you a couple of, of examples. Um, if a medication is exempt, it's usually because either A, it has been determined that it does not present a substantial risk to children and birth control pills fall in this category, or B, it presents too much of a burden to the adult. So as an example, sublingual nitroglycerin is exempt because an adult who needs it might struggle too much to open a child resistant container and therefore be prevented from getting the potentially life-saving drug inside. Manufacturers can offer a non-compliant package as, an, as, a, uh, as a choice, but only if a few rules are met. First, only if it's not corrosive. Second, only if it's not the only size of package offered and in particular not the most popular size. So as an example, uh, if you buy a, a, bo a bottle of Advil that has uh, let's say 20 tablets in it, that's a very popular size and that will come in a child resistant container. But if you buy a bottle that has 300 or I guess this bottle here has 160, that is a less popular size container. It doesn't sell as well and therefore the company can can sell that in a non-child resistant model. So some lawyers really went to work on that. 
Notice that if they do provide a non-compliant version of their product, the label has to say, this package is for households without young children. And it has to be in a conspicuous spot, like where this orange arrow is pointing. It can't be hidden in tiny, tiny print on the back. And then lastly, by consumer request. So the patient or the prescriber can request non-CR packages, um, like my mother, for example, who suffers from arthritis. Most pharmacies are gonna ask first about children in the home, and they're gonna be reluctant to fill a prescription into a non-compliant uh, package if there are young kids present. Also, many pharmacies are gonna uh, require the request in writing, um, and they may, they may have a, a standing order policy at their pharmacy where you can, you can have a standing order to have all of your prescriptions always put in a non-child resistant container, but most pharmacies will routinely update that just to make sure that your circumstances haven't changed. Who is responsible for ensuring that the PPPA regulations are being honored? In the retail setting, the pharmacist is responsible. And by the way, pharmacists uh, are able to request test data about um, the child resistant testing that was done on that on any package from the manufacturer or the distributor. When doctors are dispensing free samples, they are the ones responsible. By the way, you cannot reuse uh, plastic uh, vials or containers um, when you're getting your prescriptions refilled because the plastic cap might become compromised over time. All that opening and closing. Innovations continue today. Manufacturers are always trying to design a better cap. Here's an idea that's been really popular, the flow restrictor. Testing shows that the flow restrictor does work. Um, it helps prevent large amounts of liquid from coming out when you turn the bottle upside down but it doesn't work quite well enough to meet all of the requirements of a child resistant law by itself. So you still have to use a flow restrictor with a child resistant cap. The phrase child proof gets tossed around all the time in our society. Child proof bottles, child proof baby gates, child proof your home. But we now know there's no such thing. Given enough time, children can eventually figure it out. But it's not always about that. It isn't always that a child eventually figures out the mechanism. They learn how to you know, push and turn or whatever. Kids can find all kinds of ways to get into a package of hazardous stuff. Uh, they could drop it from the top of the stairs and crack it open. They could smash it with a toy. So that is why public education messages always use this phrase, click up and away, click the cap shut, and then store the container up out of the sight and reach of children. This is the, the number one most important way to prevent childhood poisonings. It is also important to use child resistant caps, but they should not be used alone. By themselves, they're not enough. I got a lot of sources. I'll be happy to share with you. If anybody's interested, just let me know. I'll send you uh, this list. And thank you for hanging in there with me for this presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a few things. Have a good day.